And now I'll turn us over to John Taylor. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, excited to see uh, people coming in and our, our participants pain here. Um, so today, um, I mean, this is this is not on topic with what we've been talking about the last few weeks. I was going to see if there's a time. There's not. This is just something that I've been interested in that I think um, has a it has a lot of utility uh, for for relationships. And um, you know, one of the goals of of for for me with this webinar here is giving people tools that they can use day one into recovery that will improve their relationships. So we're going to talk about speech in relationship, like literally the words that we say. Um, so it, it always makes me smile a little bit when I talk to a new couple on the phone before scheduling with them. I'd say probably 75% of the time, uh, one or both of them say something like, you know, our big problem is communication. We just have to work on communication. Um, and I always smile a little bit because I, I think that is the I think that's a euphemism <laughs> for uh, things are really terrible and this is as far as we want to go as we want to look at our communication. Um, uh, I, I actually think a lot of problems in relationships are based on communication, but it's not that simple because uh, what, what people mean when they say communication is the words that we're using to talk to each other. Um, communication happens on so many other levels. Um, uh, in any relationship. And so I want to give you a view today um, into how we use words and what it means, uh, the way we use words. So not what we're saying, but how we're saying it. And how, if you are not um, careful, if you're not deliberate about how you talk, you can actually, you can send signals uh, that uh, your intentions are not good uh, with the person that you are, are trying to communicate with. Um, so overall, I would say a focus on the words that are said actually trips up other communication. Um, it can make it more confusing. So for example, if uh, you and your partner are talking about um, uh, where you want a vacation and the words your partner is saying um, sound like agreement, but there's something that just feels like you keep asking, is this really what you want? Is this really what you want? And your partner becomes annoyed with you and then a big fight ensues. Um, usually that disconnect between what's being said and what's being felt is a very real thing. And the speaker isn't usually aware of it. And the listener is usually not aware of why they feel the disconnect. Um, so I think people really like words and they like focusing on words uh, in relationships because it's very left-brained. Uh, that means it's less connected with feeling and sensation. Um, it's more logical, it feels more organized, it can feel containing and calming um, for the person that is speaking the words. Um, I watch this with couples all the time when one party talks and talks and talks um, and they think they're doing a really good job at driving their point home and you know making their partner understand where they're coming from. And when they finally stop talking or their partner cuts them off, they don't realize that they've lost their audience because speaking is regulating for the person who's speaking. Um, using words, uh, again, it's, it's a largely a left brain operation. So if you have a lot going on somatically, if you have a lot going on emotionally, uh, moving the energy to your left brain is going to feel good to you. Um, for the person who's listening, words are activating. Um, because the goal of communicating is not actually to get your point across, especially in an intimate relationship. The goal of communicating is to keep your audience. Everything you do as a couple is a journey. And that journey is either you either show each other that I'll do the journey by myself with or without you, or doing this with you is the most important thing to me. So uh, actually, when I watch couples communicate in my office, uh, sometimes if I'm getting too lost in the words, I just imagine that they're barking at each other or something like that, because it helps me focus on the way that they're talking. Um, for, for most of the time, what's being said is not the most relevant thing, because when the audience gets lost, usually what is what is shown is some kind of disregard, some kind of insensitivity, some kind of unfairness, and it's usually not in the actual words that are said. Um, it's in the manner that, that they're said. So um, 
and, and actually conveying information accurately is done better when you focus on how you're speaking, not what you're trying to say. Again, if you focus on, have I kept my audience? Is this person actually here with me? Is what I'm saying aggravating them? Um, and is it aggravating them because uh, of the content of what's being said? They don't like what they hear, or is it aggravating because of the manner that I'm, I'm doing this in? And in saying that, I just became hyper aware and I wish I could see faces so I could see how much my um, disorganized presentation is making each of you <laughs> mad. <laughs> um, but uh, so, sorry, that's a side note. We'll, we'll get to we'll get to bad communication here and how that's a good example of that in a minute. Um, so uh, it's, it's also the purpose of communication is not to make your partner happy um, because the, the, the actual exchange, the actual power in a bonded relationship comes from the sharing of information and the sharing of truth. Uh, that's, that's the biggest factor I would say in what makes, makes both people feel like bosses and makes most people feel like they're in charge of the relationship is when both have complete information and complete access to truth. So a lot of people will focus on, um, we don't talk about what makes us mad, which is a big mistake. Um, we don't talk about things that um, are uncomfortable um, because we feel like we've lost our audience. And then they question like, why don't we feel close? Why aren't we in sync? Why don't we want the same things? Um, and it, again, it all has to do with um, you've, you've chosen to substitute real communication for the exchange of words that are pleasant. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you, uh, these are called Grice's Maxims. Um, and uh, these, have, these are rules for collaborative communication, or I should say markers of collaborative communication. Um, and in, in my estimation, um, the, the gold standard for a coupleship is secure functioning. And a huge part of secure functioning is collaboration. And how well do you actually collaborate? Um, collaboration is not the same as negotiation um, or uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Um, giving something up. Uh, compromise. Um, uh, collaboration is fully working together on a problem. Collaboration is not working on one another. Collaboration is not changing the subject and attacking and defending. Collaboration is staying focused on the problem and staying focused on what we're going to do about it. So um, Grice's maxims, uh, they describe cooperative effective communication. Um, in other words, the way you use words conveys whether or not you're really willing to play ball with your partner. So I'm going to throw these out there, both as a way for you to kind of um, calibrate to what's going on when, you're, when your partner or somebody else may talk to you and you feel off. This may help you understand some of why you feel off. These are also self-checks. So examine your own communication patterns. And if you are guilty of, of violating any of these maxims, it might be good for you to focus on um, improving the quality of your, of your speech a little bit, especially if you're really wanting to send the message, I'm a team player here and I wanna work with you. So the first maxim is quantity. So this is using the right amount of words. Um, so one of the big things that I learned uh, in school becoming a therapist was the difference between open-ended and closed-ended questions. Um, and we really got it you know, trained into us, um, you want to ask open-ended questions most of the time because you want your clients to open up and explore. So if you ask yes or no questions, you'll get yes or no answers. So quality would be um, if, if you're talking to somebody or if somebody's talking to you and um, the, an open-ended question is asked and they give a one or two word answer, that would be inappropriate quantity of words. Um, or if a one word question is asked and a long winded answer is given. So, um, you know, for example, with couples all the time, I'll say things like, uh, do you think he's mad at you? Oh, well, he's always mad at me. And, you know, here's the history of that. And here's how inappropriate his anger is. And uh, so sometimes I'll watch where it goes. Often I'll say that was a yes or no question. Do you think he's mad with you right now? Um, so again, violations to, to quantity, the inappropriate number of words in response to communication can show that there is a different agenda. Um, the person's not there to collaborate and be in the moment. They may be about something else. Um, these aren't necessarily lie detector things, but sometimes they can, this can indicate dishonesty. 
sometimes it can indicate just complete um, lack of uh, attunement. Um, the person's really not in the moment. Again, that's part of why when someone's talking, you may listen to the words they say and say, well, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like we're agreeing, but I don't know why I feel so bugged. Um, again, that's one, one place to look. The wrong amount of words is being used. Quality. Are you actually saying anything? Um, I have a friend that I, I went to graduate school with who I, I think he's the poster child for this. The, the guy has a really great vocabulary and I always learn interesting words from him. But if I stop and, and think about what he's actually communicating, he actually says very little with a lot of words. Um, so that's a violation to quality. Um, people use fancy words to say little. Um, think language in contracts, especially if you know, the, <laughs> Scott, Scott makes a blah face, um, especially if I, I have a law degree and I used to do contracts. It's just oh. <laughs> All right. I didn't know you had a law degree. Um, so, that, I mean, that's that's a very different kind of writing than what you do now. Um, you, you're writing for clarity and mutual understanding. You, you tell me if this is, Scott, too misinformed by my my knowledge of the law that comes from TV but in some contract negotiations, you do want the language to be confusing because you can slip things in and yeah. people don't notice what you're really saying. Sadly, that is true. <laughs> yeah, so uh, TV doesn't lie about everything. Um, so uh, again, when you're talking with somebody, um, a, a lack of quality in what they're saying, really being precise, actually saying something um, it, it's really, it's really meaningful. If you ever had a, a conversation with somebody where you find yourself saying, I, I just want them to stop talking. I want to be done with this conversation. Often that's a violation of quality. It feels like the person is, is, uh, taking up your attention, um, rather than really communicating with you. And that can feel unsafe. Um, especially think of a, a betrayal situation where there has been a bait and switch or a look over here so I can get away with this. Um, so I see this a lot with the, the folks in recovery that I work with. Um, they may mistake vulnerability for, uh, gosh, I've been telling my kids about this. I had a teacher in seventh grade who would say, you have diarrhea of the mouth. Um, so they, they may mistake vulnerability for diarrhea of the mouth, which is I'm just saying a lot of things. Um, another uh, one of the maxims is relation or relevance. So um, how much does what you're saying actually have to do with what we're talking about? So when someone speaks with high relevance, they omit unnecessary information. You can really drill down on this and things like ums, ahs, ers, um, those are all, those, those can be violations of relevance. It's extra noise. Um, see, I just did it there. Uh, most of that is a, it's a space filler. Again, it's an anxiety reducer. As long as my voice is going, I've got the attention on me, I'm in charge here. Um, do you really know what you're talking about? This is another uh, relevance uh, thing. And I see couples do this all the time. They don't stay on topic. So we may start talking about the vacation plans this weekend. And all of a sudden we're talking about uh, every Christmas from the past or every time your mother has made things difficult for us or why you don't take out the garbage. That's a violation of relevance again. Um, collaboration doesn't just happen naturally. We really have to work at it. So I'll see couples violate relevance because they get in an emotional uh, branch. Uh, they get in a, a, a grievance branch and they forget we actually have work to do here. There's, there's a problem we're trying to solve. We're not trying to, you know, set up every grievance that we've had or solve every problem we've ever had. We're trying to solve this one. The last maxim is manner. So, uh, this has to do with how things are said. Is it clear? Is there any kind of obscurity? Is there any ambiguity? So generally when it comes to manner, uh, brief and to the point is preferred over flowery language and, and taking a long time to get there. We also look at with manner, is it orderly? Do we provide information in an order that actually makes sense? Uh, again, there can be reasons why people violate these that don't have to do with a lack of collaboration. Some people like to hear themselves talk. Some people have a disorganized thought process. But when it comes to the, the real like meat of what we have to solve in a relationship, I, I say to my couples a lot of the time, you'll, you'll never spend more time and energy and resource on anything outside of this relationship. 
Uh, so make sure what you do is is right on. Make sure you're really deliberate with this. Uh, make sure you're you're swinging for the fences, so to speak. Um, so th these aren't necessarily signs of deception or lack of collaboration, but it can explain some of the reasons why when you're talking with someone, it just feels off. So so like I said, these can be useful to look for in in conversations that bother you. I think it's even more useful to look for how do I do with each of these? Because if you're really wanting to convey something important and get some relationship work done, um, staying in line with these maxims, the quality, the quantity, the relation and the relevance and the manner uh, really can help further your cause. So some, some suggestions for how to not just use words to soothe yourself when you talk. Number one, allow for pauses in the conversation for you to feel what you're feeling and to read what's going on with your partner. That can be nerve wracking because sometimes when you uh, bring up a topic of conversation, if you slow down, you might see how disappointed or upset your partner is. Um, if that's a true reaction, you, you need to deal with that. You need to know about that rather than try to make it go away. Um, if you don't know what to say, say that. I'm not sure what to say here. Because uh, again, it would be a violation of quantity if you were just silent. Well, we're expecting some kind of response. Um, simply telling your partner, I'm thinking, let me process that. I'm not sure what to say here. That's much better than saying nothing or just starting to talk to see where you end up. Um, along with that, um, and I, I would say there's an asterisk by this, um, talk only when you're inspired to do so. Um, in, in other words, make sure you have something to say. Um, let me get back to you or let's pick up this conversation later after I've been able to think about that. I think in many cases is a perfectly fine alternative to just firing back and forth so that you both feel like you're in the game and in control. Again, this is collaboration. We're trying to get something done, not win. Um, read your audience. Check often to see how what you're saying is being digested. And it's not a bad sign if, if your audience is upset or if your audience is, is angry. Sometimes what we have to say is upsetting. Sometimes what we have to say does make people angry. You wanna look for congruence. So I, I think back to one, one of my favorite TV shows is Parks and Rec. And there's a couple characters on that show. There's, there's Chris Traeger play, played by Rob Lowe who is like the world's happiest person. And he dates another main character on the show and they break up. And Chris is such a nice guy that this woman that he dated, she didn't realize that they broke up and she went on for like two months as if they hadn't broken up. And he, of course, you know, was really nice and polite. And um, he, he said to her at one point, you do remember we broke up, right? And she said, what? And he goes back through the conversation and then she realizes, oh yeah, um, you did break up with me but you did it in such a nice way. Like I didn't, I didn't even feel it. So when you're communicating information that you know is hard, don't get so concerned about making your other, the other party feel good that they miss the point of what you're saying. If what you're saying is hard, that ought to register. So if, if I'll say this to, to, to couples who say our main problem is communication, nine times out of 10, they don't look at each other when they talk. And that's where I'll start with them. Oh, no wonder why your problem is communication. You guys don't really care uh, what, what the other one is, is responding to. You don't watch each other. Um, so make sure that you're really reading your audience and don't be afraid of their reactions. If you're not intending hurt and hurt happens, great, you caught it. You can repair really quick and you can get back on track. Um, if you were intending something to be funny and it wasn't funny, uh, great, you can repair. Um, you, you can apologize, uh, you, you can you know, get back in, in tune with your audience. Because again, the main purpose of, of communicating um, in a coupleship, in a relationship is to, um, how did I say it before? It's to keep your audience, it's to stay together, not necessarily to win, um, not necessarily to persuade, um, but it's, it's to do what you're doing together. So that is speech in relationships. Wow, <laughs> thank you. Um, I typed in um, Grice's maxims for, for conversation if people wanna look this up, um, which I'm gonna do. Um, 
I, as you were talking, I, I always I, I couldn't help but picture the Charlie Brown cartoons with walk, 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 because this is what I mean. That's why that's so funny. Is mm -hmm. we just tune out sometimes and walk, walk, walk. It's like uh, you know we're off in La La Land. We're not listening. Um, and and just to review quantity, uh, too many words or not enough words. And I like that you said, you know, it could be a sign of dishonesty. It could be a lack of attunement and it could be any number of things. But, uh, you know, when people are lying to me, they're either giving me a one word answer or they're going on and on and on. <laughs> Something I didn't ask. So yeah, um, quality, are you actually, so that's when I cracked up. Are you actually saying anything? Love that. Um, relevance, are you on topic and manner? You know, how are we saying this? Um, are we clear? Are we, you know, orderly and to the point? Um, usually that means we're telling the truth and, you know, um, and, and I like that you, that you mentioned, and I mean, I think this is what this is all about. We don't want to have the tough conversations a lot of the time. Um, and that creates a lack of attunement. This, when couples come in and say, communication is our problem, it, it's really, they're just not, they're not communicating about the tough stuff. They're probably communicating fine about the easy stuff. I mean, am I reading that right? Or am I I'm reading too much? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I've, I've only worked with a handful of couples that I thought, oh, wow, we really have to start at basics here. Um, the 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 problem is usually not do we know how to communicate it's um do we communicate in a safe manner especially around the difficult things um you know i watch couples all the time where you know they can talk about where to go eat dinner but you put sex on the table and all of a sudden they're like this with each other when they're both saying like i want a good relationship with you um so it's again, these, these maxims, I think, are helpful because it can help you read a disconnect between the words that are said and the feelings that are being felt, because um, that's, that's valid. Um, humans are good BSers, and we, we will work hard to say the right thing, even if it's disconnected from what we feel. I think what these, these maxims encourage us to do is to uh, stay aligned, stay congruent, um, with what's actually going on inside of us or what's actually going on in, inside the, the relationship, inside the conversation. Yeah. Um, okay, let's get to the questions because there's a bunch of good ones in here already. Um, silence is also communication, right? Um, the former narcissistic partner let people know, especially me, that he was angry or whatever. Um, being punished for years with silence is very degrading and hurts. Um, I felt so worthless and powerless. I still feel the pain at times. Now I'm kind of sensitive when I get ignored. How can I self help myself get over this? So silence is a communication, and but it can mean a whole bunch of different things. So maybe you could address that and then address the specifics yeah. of you know, the silent treatment. Which silence, is really silence is a, it is a form of communication. And I would say it's a pretty heavy hitter because um, if you understand how the human brain works in the absence of information, we go to the worst possible uh, scenario. So if you're using silence deliberately, that's what you're setting your, your communication partner up for. Um, I'll use silence all the time in sessions, not because I want people to hurt, but because I want, like, like they're trying to stay out of the feeling, they're trying to stay above the negative emotion. I'll use silence to let the negative emotion come up if it needs to happen. In a relationship, I would say silence is always a nuclear option. Um, it's always going to do a ton of damage. And so the, this person is right on here. It's, it's punishing, it's degrading, it hurts, it makes me feel worthless and powerlessness. So um, when I get ignored, how can I help myself get over this? I, I think the, the best thing to do is exercise your right in a relationship to get information from your partner at any time about what they're thinking or feeling. So your partner's quiet. Um, maybe they're just a quiet person. Maybe they're thinking about work. Um, your brain isn't going to fill in the gaps correctly. So, so the ability to say, what are you thinking right now? Or you've been really quiet. Can you tell me why? Um, that's one of the best ways that you can start decreasing the sensitivity is, is recognizing that essentially you have a right to protest the, the silence or you at least have a right to know what's this about. Sometimes your partner may come back to you and, and calibrate you exactly while I'm angry with you. Okay. 
um, that, that at least gives a starting point for how we're going to deal with this. So are you going to be angry and keep shutting me out or can we talk? Uh, can, can we try to solve this? Um, that, that I would say is probably the most direct way to help yourself with the sensitivity is exercise your right to, uh, I'll use the word demand, demand from your partner, tell me what's going on inside of you because I can't see it right now. Yeah. And then in the wider world, sometimes we do, you know, people just don't pay attention to us sometimes the way we think they should, you know, right? You know, I was trying to get a waiter's attention for 15 minutes in a restaurant the other day because I wanted to order. Um, I mean, so so this is a person who I, I think part of this question is anytime that this individual gets ignored in any way, it probably feels like the silent treatment from somebody. Is there a way to understand that sometimes silence is, you know, different than, 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 yeah. than the nuclear yeah. option? Yes, and, and it, it requires some, like in trauma healing, we call it uh, reorientation. It requires some reorientation. You have to read the current situation, not through the lens of the previous, but I think that's gonna be hard to do inside your own head. So, um, you know, with, with safe people, you practice. I have a couple that I work with right now that one of their biggest de-escalating statements is they'll say to each other, are you mad at me? And they'll use the pet name for each other. Um, because they do a lot of silence with each other and it's not always anger. In fact, very rarely is it, but when it is anger, it's pretty bad. So they've learned to check, uh, sweetie, are you mad at me? Oh no, I'm just thinking. Um, or if they are, yeah, I am upset and we need to talk. Um, either way, it helps to calibrate what exactly is going on here. Remember that your, your perception or your, your state will drive your perception. So if you're feeling scared, what you see will be scary until you get other information about it. So um, in, in order to heal some of this, you, you kind of have to poke your head out of the foxhole and take a risk at finding out what's really going on um, if you actually don't know. Yeah. Um, which takes us right into our next question here. How, is, how important is it for a couple to talk on a regular basis? Um, my sex had a husband is a quiet person and almost always I am the one to start a conversation and ask questions. Um, also, he just signed up for one of your classes. <laughs> but if I don't ask questions, I don't think we would ever talk about where we are in this process. Um, I'm, I'm glad he signed up for a classes with us. Um, so you've got a, a, a quiet person and one person has to sort of generate the conversation. Is that healthy? Is, is that unhealthy? What, and what, what can we do to even it out? Half of it's healthy is if you're recognizing that you have a need for conversation and communication that maybe your partner doesn't have at the same level. It, it is partly your responsibility to make sure your needs are taken care of. Um, it's also on a partner to know, like you have to know how your partner operates. So for example, I'm very much a homebody and I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty satisfied with hanging around at home on the weekend. My spouse, she can feel stir crazy. And if I just, you know, go by how I feel, we would not go out and do things as frequently as we do. Knowing that that's something that's important to her and that she needs at least half the time, I'm making sure that we get that need met. Um, so this is, this is two person system thinking. Um, it's not, it, it's not valid to say, well, this is just how I work and you're going to have to get over it. Um, no, uh, this is, this is how I operate and you also operate a different way. And our job is to care for each other. So I would say, um, e even couples who are maybe a little less, you know, social, outgoing, verbal, they still have a need to communicate frequently. They have to look at each other. Um, they have to at least read what's going on. Um, so that, like, that staying in my own world and not coming out, um, that's a little less about an attachment style, more about, a, like, an anxiety um, like managing anxiety, managing emotion, it, it's auto regulating. So um, I think making the understanding clear, uh, we need to look out for each other. So, so on the flip side of this, 
if your partner gets overstimulated or over anxious with too much stimulation, it's on you to ensure that they get some time to come down by themselves just as much as it's on them. Again, you, you know about each other and you, you take care of each other. Is, is this a couple that might benefit from like a, at 8 PM every night, we'll do a quick check-in. We'll, we'll take 15 yeah. minutes for the two of us and one, we'll answer these questions. And, you know, whatever. one thing, one thing I noticed with those more avoidant partners, it's not that they don't want to talk. It's that, um, it can be hard for them to get started. So actually having a ritual, having something planned, it's like Christmas. If you're not ready the week before Christmas, you get ready. Um, so it, it can be really helpful to have kind of a standing appointment. I've also found with some of these people, um, they can talk and talk about things they're interested in. So someone who's maybe a little more introverted and kind of withdrawn, they may not be like literally they may not be super interested in other people's emotions and experiences, but you get them talking about a hobby, you get them talking about, you know, some point in history, something they're reading and they can talk and talk and talk. So again, you have to, you, you go back to like, what, what's the quality? What's the relation that I need here? If we need to talk about emotions, set each other up to be ready to do that. If it's, I just need to hear your voice, learn how to talk about what interests your partner. And you'll, you'll find there's very few people who across the board don't like to talk. If you get somebody on the right topic, something that's interested in relative, relative to them, most people can, can go for a really long time. Okay. Um, this is something that Dr. David Fawcett talks about. Sometimes he talks about using my left eye to look in your left eye while we're talking. Is a it, it the left eye connects to the right brain, which is the feeling part. I think. Um, is this something that you've heard of? Have you tried it? Does it work? Does it help? Um, I I actually I haven't I haven't used like eye specific gaze. Uh, for, for couples communicating, but interesting, like one of the forms of EMDR that I'm trained in actually uses one eye because it connects with different parts yeah. of the brain. So um, I, I will say when it comes to eye contact in a partnership, you, you have to remember that only like 20% of the middle of your visual field is high definition, everything else you're legally blind in. So you'll perceive threat if you're not looking at each other head on. So even just creating safety to talk eye to eye gaze, whether it's left eye to left eye or, you know, both eyes or whatever, um, eye to eye gaze is, is literally far safer than, for example, trying to have a conversation in a car. I was just in a session earlier today and I caught something out of my peripheral vision. It looked like there was a spider about this big on the wall. So, you know, uh, slyly, I, I ended up looking over, there was nothing on the wall. Again, it was this, it was this fluke in what I saw. So, so anything less than direct gaze, you're you're prone for error and you're prone to see danger there because we're blind. Now I'm going to see, be seeing spiders for like the next week. Thank Sorry, you, Scott. We really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this next question is from um, the betrayed partner. Um, the 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 um, the person in recovery has been there for a couple of years, but still seems to lack empathy, uh, is still blaming, et cetera. Um, she says, our communication is terrible. He stonewalls, blames, name calls, belittles, gaslights, et cetera. Um, and the question is, um, how should she respond when her husband tells her who she is? Meaning like you're mean and unsafe for me, or you can't handle the truth. You'll just use it to punish me, things like that. You know, when he tells her, who she is and what she's going to do, you know, of course that makes her want to scream, which she puts in here. That's a very long question. I'm, I'm, I'm synopsizing, but what, you know, how do you respond when somebody communicates in that sort of aggressive shut you down kind of version? Yeah. My, my first question, have, have you ever done this in front of a marriage therapist? Um, I, I think that's a, I mean, th this is more than just a you know, a one line thing. This really needs some support if this is a communication pattern. Um, but I, I think bottom line, um, you don't have to play ball with everything your partner says, especially if it's clearly not collaborative, um, if it's really not working together. So saying something like, um, you know, we're not gonna go any further if this is how you're gonna talk with me 
or I'm not interested in, in communicating with you this way um, when there's this much blame. I'd be happy to work on a problem with you, but don't work on me. Um, so it, it is okay to stop. It is okay to say, I'm done with this conversation and here's why. Um, because what that, that does two things. First of all, um, nobody should be hanging on to any kind of you know toxic or, or abusive kind of communication, hoping that it's gonna get better. Because if it starts out that way, it's not likely to get better. Second of all, it offers a path back. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you, but you gotta leave the blame at the door, man. It actually gives a path back. If you're willing to talk about a problem here and not me, um, if you're willing to talk about how you feel and not, not turn that into what I'm making you feel, we have something to work with. Um, but that's, I, I mean, in, in, th this is hard because th there are some times if someone's not interested in collaborating, again, they're gonna, they're gonna talk to win. So it feels like everything you say, they'll just flip you on your back. Um, you can you can walk away at that point and say, I'm, I'm not doing this until you're actually ready to collaborate with me. Yeah. So I, 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 in terms of the maxims, this is more about like probably relevance and manner than anything else. I want to talk about, you know, you forgot to take the trash out and you're telling me I can't handle the truth, <laughs> you know, yeah. not yeah. relevant in the manner. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, um, what about talking in circles? How do you get someone to stay focused? I'm loving these questions. Uh, it's it's as simple as just that, <laughs> it's as simple as that's that's not what we're talking about, or even getting agreement. Um, can we stay focused on getting the trash taken out until we solve that problem? <coughs> Are you in or not? Close-ended question. That doesn't require a big answer. That's a yes or a no. Um, so so you can you can help that by getting an agreement from your partner. This is what we're talking about, yes? Okay, they get off topic. I'm sorry, you're off topic. We're talking about the trash um, and just reminding, nudging. I actually, believe it or not, for those of you who've been following this, I have a hard time with relevance. I love rabbit trails. You know, I, I go off on stuff. So I actually really appreciate when my partner says, that's not what we're talking about. Oh, right, yep. Um, yeah, that's 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 a good way to handle that one. Yeah, so this one's quantity and and relevance. You know, the manner might be fine. You know, uh, but the quality's not there either. You're just talking in circles. I love I love I'm, I love these maxims. I'm gonna like post them somewhere. Um, so um, uh, my partner can talk all day about things that are are of interest to him, but he has been quiet since D Day. Oh, that's just a follow up from me earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, da, 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 uh, okay, here we are. All right, let, let's, let's go to the chat feature for a second because this question has been waiting for a while. Um, what does gaslighting look like um, in terms of these maxims? I think you address it, but if you could clarify. Um, so explain gaslighting via these maxims. Yeah, so, so gaslighting, um... The, these maxims can be intentional or not. Violations of these can be intentional or not. Um, some people just, they just talk a lot and they don't have much to say. Um, gaslighting has a form of intentionality to it. So I would say a violation of these can be used intentionally with, with uh, gaslighting. Um, but that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the difference. So for example, like in quantity, um, gaslighting would be, um, turning a one word answer into a big explanation that you get lost in and maybe even turning it, turning it on you. Now, instead of answering the question, I've got a question that I've just fired back at you. That would be a violation of quantity. Um, <clears throat> quality, again, could be the, uh, again, this, this friend of mine, I've seen him do it when he doesn't want to talk about something. He goes into his like million dollar vocabulary. And there have been times I've said to him, um, if you want to keep talking, you got to stop. Like you have to use real words because this is really annoying me. Um, so gaslighting can, it, it can be kind of obscuring um, the, the question, obscuring what's being said in, intentionally. Again, the relevance, that would be switching the topic, turning it on you, um, talking about something else entirely. I have one guy that I work with that uh, he, 
he's got a real problem with when, whenever his spouse confronts him at something directly, he goes up to a high level and he wants to talk theory about this. So, well, you know, in our society, men are treated like this and women are treated like this. And, you know, she'll often say to him, um, that, that's interesting, but I, I actually just wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about like, what are we going to do for our daughter's birthday? <laughs> you know, so, so the gaslighting uh, can be changing the subject. The manner, um, I think talking down to, talking sarcastically is a huge thing that I see in gaslighting. You really think that's a good question? Um, uh, yeah, so, so gaslighting can use violations of these maxims, but it's not the only way that gaslighting happens. Yeah, gaslighting is, is can you explain what, what gaslighting is just in a general way, just, just in case? Yeah, so, so it's here. intentionally causing someone to doubt their reality um, is a simple way to put it. So I'm trying to throw you off the scent. Um, I'm trying to make you look at what I want you to look at. I'm trying to get you confused, ultimately for the goal of, of you know, backing off. And chronic gaslighting, uh, what it really does is undermines a person's sense of reality. So they have a lot of doubt in their own perceptions, which if you're into hiding things and keeping secrets, that's exactly, I mean, you, you've got them where you want them. If this person now doesn't even feel like they can perceive correctly, they're going to question you a lot less frequently. Yeah, it's... I'm not cheating. Why would you think I'm cheating? You're, you're crazy. You're you're all of the problems are you not trusting me. What I want you to try, it's like, you know, even though I know I'm cheating, I just flip it on you and make this all about you um, instead of me. Um, and, and I cause you to question your perception of reality. That's not lipstick on my collar. That's marinara sauce. You yeah. taste it, go ahead. You know, yeah. but then I throw it in the wash before you can taste it, you know, but it's obviously lipstick, but I still, you know, um, and the, the thing about gaslighting is it, it starts slowly. Um, it usually starts, oh, honey, I have to stay stay at work late tonight. Um, I'll be home by midnight. You know, and if, you, you know, you're in a relationship, you want to believe your partner. So, of course, you choose to believe your partner. Then, you know, suddenly your partner is, you know, three years later, your partner is saying, I, I told you I had to go away on business. You, I told you over breakfast last week, you must have been sleepy and you must have not heard me, um, you know, after disappearing on you for three days and, and you're struggling with, is he lying to me or not? Even though it's an obvious blatant lie. Yeah. This is what gaslighting does to people. It's, it's, it's abusive to the recipient. Um, yeah. I mean, it's psychologically abusive um, and, and done over time and, and with great <laughs> effort um, it can be really br brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Ga gaslighting. I would, if, if there's a history of really intense gaslighting, trust is very difficult to restore um, because of how active a role the betraying partner has taken in destroying reality. Yeah. It's, it's an intentional thing. Um, yeah. I'm just going to destroy your ability to sense reality as a way of protecting the behavior that I, that I want to continue to engage in that you'd rather I didn't. Um, okay. Um, my sex addict husband has recently begun responding to me. Oh, go ahead. Scott, can we go back to the one above that? I, I think that's actually, oh, sorry. and then we can go, sorry. Yeah, this, this is a follow-up to the one where, um, you know, um, when the husband is telling the betrayed partner how, what she's thinking and feeling, you're mean and unsafe for me, or you can't yeah. handle the truth, et cetera. This is a follow-up to that. Sorry. Um, what if it, that's exactly what he's hoping for, for the conversation to stop? Um, he doesn't want to talk. It's just me starting the conversation and him abusing me through it. Um, sorry, I missed that. So here's, here's, my, here's my feeling on that. I don't think he wants it to stop. I think he wants it on his terms. And again, I'm talking generally like an amalgamation of, of people I've seen who do this. So, so my, my guess would be if you really stopped conversation, he would get very uncomfortable. Um, very, very few people who I know actually want to be completely disconnected. They want to be in control. So what you're doing when you're saying, I'm not having this conversation with you, and then you hold that. No, we're not talking until you can be fair, until you can be just, equitable. We can focus on the problem together. If you actually hold that line, 
that that's where you are asserting your right to be as in control as he is. No, we do this in a collaborative way. Where we don't do it at all. So it, it can look like what, what, what he may want in the short term is I want this conversation to stop, but he doesn't want all conversation to stop. And that's what you put on the table. Unless you can be collaborative with me, we don't, we don't talk. You don't, you don't get my companionship. So um, you, you got to remember with a lot of the ways that couples fight, they, they're playing the short game, not the long game. Um, so if, if you're having these kind of like tactical uh, problems in a relationship, if you keep playing the short game, you'll keep out maneuvering each other. If one person actually gets focused on the long game and sets that as the expectation, it makes it very difficult for the short game stuff to get any traction. Yeah. Um, and it does take two to tango here. I mean, you know, if we, if we want to have, you know, healthy, healthy community, if we want to have secure uh, functioning and collaboration, you know, it takes two of us. Um, yep. And you have, may have to drag somebody into it <laughs> unwillingly or not. But um, Which goes to the next question here. My, my sex addiction has, been, has recently become, begun responding to any emotions or concerns I express in conversation by quickly shifting to sarcasm or going on at length about his own feelings and perspective or offering advice on how to handle my situation. Um, are there suggestions on how I can be heard or is this a sign he's, he's not interested in hearing me now? I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing, you know, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a sign that he's not interested in being heard. My, my guess is uh, it, it's less likely that it's that. So, so this again is where it's really powerful to set the topic. So you say, uh, sweetie, I want to talk to you about some of my feelings. And this is the topic, my feelings. So I just want you to listen. I don't want any fixing. I don't want any perspective. And I don't want you to make jokes. I just want you to hear me. So you start talking. Of course, he won't be able to help himself because this is a this is a habitual thing. So he's going to say something sarcastic. And you say, uh, that's not what we're here for. If you're interested in um, connecting with me right now, I just need you to listen. Can you do that? Yes, I can do that. And then he offers advice. Yep, I didn't, I didn't ask for advice. Don't give me advice. I just want you to listen. Can you do that? Yes. So, so again, it's that relevance. We're going to keep this relevant. It, it is okay to, you know, come into the relationship and say, I'm going to command the time here for a minute. I need some time. Um, and here's what that's going to look like. If, if that's the only way that it happens time after time, that's unfair. But both of you have a right to pull the card that says, this is going to be about me for a minute. And when you pull that card, you don't give it up until, until you're done, until you get what you need. Yeah. So, okay, let's go to the next one here. Um, please explain to me how the sex addict husband, uh, in this case, can be jovial, conversational, and expressive with coworkers and groups of men in 12-step meetings. But all I get is stoicism and disconnection. All of those other relationships are very low. Um, the stakes are very low in those. So it's really easy to relax when the outcome really doesn't matter long term. When it comes to our primary connected relationships, um, where you and I end up is huge, like it's life changing. Um, so a lot of people respond to that kind of stress with shut down. There's also a history in your relationship that isn't in these relationships. So uh, I'll see a lot of couples who will do this. You said the stoicism and disconnect. Um, they'll do this building resentment and never really addressing things or solving things together. So the minute they're around each other, it's back to, you know, I've got my tally sheet and here's the score and yep, I'm mad at you. Um, and that's, that's where they'll pick up rather than actually addressing things. Yeah, and, and the nature of being an addict is I can do superficial, but vulnerable scares me. Um, so I can have great relationships with coworkers and neighbors because they're superficial. Um, but I probably don't have a best friend, um, particularly if I'm a guy, um, yeah. because that scares me. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to show my real self. Um, and, and the closer someone is to me, as John pointed out, the more that person can hurt me. So the person I'm most afraid of, sadly, is my long-term romantic partner because that's the person who can hurt me the most. So in recovery, um, you know, I, 
I learn how to be vulnerable with my 12 step sponsor or my therapist who's who I'm paying to listen to me, mind you. Um, so of course he's going to listen or she's going to listen. Um, and then I learn to be vulnerable with a sponsor who has the same problem that I have and has agreed to listen to me. <laughs> you know, we have a formal agreement. You will listen to me and help me. Um, and then maybe I get vulnerable with some other guys in recovery a little, little bit because they're safer than like, you know, my neighbor to, to be vulnerable with. And we kind of work our way up to the ladder. And sadly, the betrayed partner is the last one invited to the party because again, you know, we start with relationships that really don't matter all that much. You know, if my sponsor drops me, I'll find a new sponsor. You know, um, <clears throat> you know, if somebody in my 12 step group treats me badly, I'll just find some new people to get support from. But finding a new wife or husband, I don't want to do that. I like yeah. the wife or husband I have. Um, and but I'm, a, you know, and, and it's it's counterproductive to be afraid of vulnerability because the vulnerability creates the intimacy that we crave. It, it's this catch 22 for addicts. I, I kind of went on a rant there. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, no, John. The image that comes up for me, um, you can learn how to swim by starting in the shallow end of the pool and, and, you know, working your way up. You can also jump into the deep end of the pool with a lifeguard and you can figure it out there too. So um, that, that whole, like, I've got to work up to it. I totally understand where that comes from. I, I actually think with a lot of couples, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that protracted. You can jump in together and recognize we do or die here. We, we figure this out or, or we're done. And what, what I've seen with a lot of the couples that I work with, that's actually motivating to get it right faster, um, to, to go right for what scares you and, and stay with it rather than try to exit what's scaring you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, anyway, there's a follow up to this, which is how can we break this pattern of not discussing anything? So so I think you just talked about it, jumping to the deep end, but specifically, what does that involve? So, so I, I get like earlier when I said, have you done this in front of a therapist? I think that's a huge uh, thing um, is uh, to swim in the deep end. Again, you need a lifeguard. Um, I wouldn't recommend that couples just do that on their own because you'll, you'll do what you've always done and you'll run smack dab into the reasons why you've avoided this before. Um, so get some help and recognize too, is you won't change anything if you don't change anything. Um, avoidance is a really, it's my favorite coping mechanism, but it's also terrible because whatever it is you're afraid of that you avoid, you'll become more afraid of it because you don't have your eye on it. You're not understanding what it's really about. And, and again, the, the human brain works in the absence of information. We make up something terrible. So everything that you avoid and you're not staying up to date on is becoming bigger and bigger. And, and that's why I, I'm a big advocate for get on top of it fast, even if it scares you, because you'll likely find out it's not as scary as you thought. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, any good couples therapist can walk you through this. Um, I might suggest looking for somebody who, who um, has training in EFT, emotionally focused therapy, which is like a, a really, specific way to sort of break through long stand long-standing patterns like this so yeah. but any good couples therapist can probably help you do that so um anything you want to say and we're out of time so thank you everybody great questions today great topic john um anything you want to say to take us out no thank you everybody for coming and thanks for the questions i'll be excited to, to be back in a couple of weeks yeah we'll see you soon Bye. thanks everybody